Hello friends, so till now we were discussing uh, I think quite few number of uh, lectures on phase diagram and then we looked at some phase transformation kind of ideas and uh, we looked at some heat treatment procedures. Okay. So, now we will be shifting uh, our uh, course to mechanical properties okay. and before coming to mechanical properties okay, or uh, what do we call as mechanical response of material okay, to any mechanical stress or strain. Okay. So, first thing uh, we want to discuss in this is called elastic behavior. So, if you look at any material, okay, they will always show you some elastic behavior and some plastic behavior. So, first we will look at the elastic behavior and then we will go further and look at uh, plastic behavior. So, first we want to note that what do we mean by elastic behavior of the material. Okay. So, before that uh, let us define few terms here. Okay, one is the normal stress. Okay, so you can see that one uh, sample is shown here, and we are showing you a cross-sectional area here. Okay, so this is you can say cross-sectional area rather than just area. Okay, which is given by A, and we are applying one force here here on this material, which we are saying as F. Okay, so what do we mean by stress? The stress will be defined as F force divided by area. So, force per unit area is the stress which is acting on this uh, this uh, sample okay. and the unit for that will be Newton per meter square okay, or which is also can be uh, referred as Pascal. And since uh, force is applied normal to the, to the area here, the stress is uh, called normal stress and it, this can be either tensile. So, tensile means I am elongating the material or it can be compressive in nature in which case I am basically compressing the material or I am shortening the length of the, uh, the sample. Okay. So, it can be tensile where you are stretching it and it can be compressive okay. and uh, in both the cases because I am applying the force normal to the area then that is why it is called normal stress. There is another kind of stress can be possible which in which case we will call it as shear stress. So, now in this case force is applied parallel to the area. Okay. So, I am calling it as F s now because it is parallel to the area. So, again this is my area is defined and I am applying the force parallel to that. The shear stress I am defining by a symbol here as tau. Okay, which is again force per unit area uh, which will give you the uh, shear stress. Okay. Again the units will be same as Newton per meter square or Pascal. Now, there is another term. Okay. So, stress can be there and similarly there can be a, a strain. Okay. So, what do we mean by strain? A strain is basically change in length divided by initial length. Okay. Any change in the length divided by initial length is equal to strain. So, basically I, when you apply a force like this, okay, I am ch I have changed the length. So, initial length let us say for my material was L okay, and the change in length is let us say given by delta L. Okay. Then the strain will be change in length which is delta L divided by the initial length that will be equal to the normal strain again because I am measuring the strain uh, 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 on the area which is normal to the stress. Okay, so I will call it as normal strain. Similarly, there can be shear strain. Okay, which will be because of the force uh, applied to the parallel to the area. So suppose this is my initial uh, object. Okay, and I am applying a force uh, here in this direction. Okay, so because of that. Uh, my material is deformed uh, is deformed like this okay so let's say my height of this sample was h and this deformation is let's say a and this new edge is making an angle theta with the old edge okay then i can define the shear strain which is i am referring here as gamma that will be the displacement a 
divided by the perpendicular distance from the fixed end which is h a by h and that will be obviously because this is a perpendicular and this is the base okay perpendicular upon base then and this is angle theta so it will be equal to 10 theta so this is the shear strain okay because of the shear stress on the material uh, whatever strain is produced is called shear strain and that will be equal to a by h equal to 10 theta okay so these are uh, uh, definition for stress and definition for strain okay very quick uh, definitions we are doing here uh, for a very detailed uh, definition of stress uh, i would suggest that uh, as a mechanical engineer engineer student you must be going through a course called strength of materials okay in that you will see a detailed definition of stress we are not doing it here okay for that you uh, go through that particular course okay now what is elastic behavior okay so once we have defined stress and strain now we can look at elastic behavior of the material it is the material if material recovers its dimension after removal of load okay so if i have applied a load okay and uh, when i remove the load it goes back to its uh, original position okay one of the very good example uh, of understanding this type of behavior is uh, you can uh, see in springs okay so you take a spring you compress it and when you uh, leave the load it will go back to its original position okay for if i stretch it okay and uh, when i remove the load it will again go back to its original position okay so spring is one example very very close to this idea of course there are no there is no spring when we are talking about material okay but the behavior is same that when i apply the load okay it will deform when i remove the load it will come back to its original position why we are understanding of elastic behavior is important it is important because most engineering design is done in the elastic region as a mechanical engineer whatever design you are going to do for any structure okay it has to be done under elastic limit okay that means it has to be done where the material show elastic behavior you cannot cross the uh, yield uh, or you cannot cross the limit where it starts deforming plastically okay because if it does deform plastically that means it uh, the material has failed okay so in the strength of material approach again that uh, that will come uh, uh, to understand as a yield criteria so for any engineering design it is important that your material should not cross the uh, elastic behavior of uh, region okay macroscopically if you see most polycrystalline material are elastically isotropic so we don't have any problem of uh, uh, that they may show an isotropy microscopically it can have anisotropy but since materials most of the engineering material are, are polycrystalline i don't have to worry about that then there is another concept called viscoelastic pro properties of material in which case this reversible deformation that occurs is dependent on time if it is not a viscoelastic okay normal elastic behavior then as soon as i leave the load it will go back to its original position okay without any time delay okay but if there is any time delay involved in this okay and as i told you earlier also that any time factor when it comes it is called visco is uh, uh, a prefix is added so if 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 the reversible deformation is time dependent it takes some time to go back to its original position then that is called viscoelastic behavior so this is how uh, elastic behavior will look like in a typical stress strain curve okay so you have stress on the y axis and strain on the x axis please remember when we show something like this we are showing it in because when we do a tensile test okay what we impose on the material is strain not the stress okay we force the material to deform and the stress is the response of the material to this elongation or strain okay in normal apply practice basically we apply the load and the material responses in form of strain okay so there can be different situation in different cases but when we do a tensile test okay 
uh, what we are imposing or what is the independent variable is strain. I am deforming my cross head uh, of the machine is moving and it is deforming the material. It is imposing a strain okay, and material is responding in form of stress okay, and that is what is uh, measured using load cell in the machine okay, and that is what is reported. Okay. So, basically uh, on the x axis it can be elongation okay, movement of the cross head or you can convert that into strain because delta L by L. Uh, it will also give you force okay, from the machine that can be converted to stress. So, force divided by initial area that will give you stress and the elastic in the elastic part it will have this linear behavior between strain and stress. So, stress is linearly dependent on strain okay. and the slope of this linear curve is what we call as elastic modulus or Young's modulus E. Okay. So, slope of the curve will give you E and this linear independent the dependence of stress on strain which is what we call as Hooke's law stress is proportional to strain. So, sigma is equal to E into strain okay. that is what is Hooke's law. What it measure, measures elastic modulus or Young's modulus measures the resistance of a material to elastic deformation as I told you that whatever deformation I am imposing it is its resistance. So, if you have high elastic modulus that means resistance will be more it will you will really require more stress. So, if, if a material has low elastic modulus the it will be the slope will be small if material has very high elastic modulus the slope will be high. So, resistance will be high for the same amount of deformation okay. in this case the stress is this much in this case the stress is this much resistance has increased. So, it gives you a resistance to deformation okay. and it is the response of the material in form of a stress when you are imposing a strain. In case of shear strain also you can do same thing similarly shear, shear strain is proportional to shear stress. So, uh, uh, sorry shear stress is proportional to shear strain. So, I will just do some small correction here. So, that tau is equal to g gamma. Okay. So, here you are getting a new elastic modulus, okay. a new elastic constant which is the shear modulus or modulus of rigidity. So, when I am doing under shear condition then I am going to use the shear modulus. When I am doing a, in a tensile uh, uniaxial tensile or compressive type of uh, experiment then I will be relating the stress with the strain using Young's modulus. So, what type of deformation I am doing I have to choose elastic constant accordingly. So, this is the spring analogy for uh, elastic uh, uh, deformation as I told you okay, that you have atoms okay, and atoms are basically having bonds between them. Okay and then bonds can be considered as spring. Okay. So, when I am deforming it the spring is getting stretched. So, as soon as I remove the force it will go back to its original position. Okay. So, removal of force will bring spring to initial dimension. So, I can use a spring analogy to explain this that a solid is made of hard sphere which are atom and connected by a spring which are interatomic forces or potential. Okay, and as soon as I remove the force it will go back to its original position. Okay. So, basically if you look at elastic behavior applied force is transmitted by the network of bonds constituting the material. So, of course, there are bonds between the atoms. The elastic behavior depends quantitatively on the magnitude of the interatomic forces. So, if, if you have a stronger bond okay, then you will require more force to deform it. Okay that means the elastic Young's modulus of that material will be high. So, if stronger bonds are there elastic modulus will be high Young's modulus will be high. More interatomic forces you have more uh, bond strength more Young's modulus. Elastic properties do not depend on microstructure of the material. This is very important to note that my Young's modulus does not depend on the microstructure of the material. So, you can have fine grain, you can have coarse grain whatever it is not going to depend on the uh, on the microstructure the elastic modulus. Okay. It is only dependent on the bond strength and that is not changing. 
So, bond forms an atom either share example it can be covalent or metallic bonds or it can be ionic bonds ok. So, depending upon different type of bonds you will have different bond strength and different elastic modulus. Of course, uh, the bond strength uh, bond uh, uh, length should be such that that it is minimizing the uh, potential energy for the system ok. So, let me just uh, bring this aspect out. If you see in terms of potential energy, okay, the curve for potential energy is something like this. Okay, this is the distance okay, so it will be something like this. This is the position where you will are going to have minimum energy. Okay, so, this is this will be the uh, bond length. So, distance between atoms. Okay. So, this is the distance equilibrium distance. If I bring them closer, uh, the potential energy will increase. If I then take them apart, again the potential energy will increase. Okay, so, whether I do stretching or whether I bring them closer in both the cases the potential energy will increase okay, and that is what uh, we do not want and that is what atoms do not want. Okay, so, as soon as I remove the force it will try to go back to its minimum potential energy configuration which is what is the equilibrium distance between the atoms. Okay. So, this is what is the driving force for elastic deformation. These are some values of uh, Young's modulus of different material type. Okay. So, you can see that uh, covalent or ionic bonds are very strong bonds, so very high elastic modulus. Okay. And this is for metallic bonds, uh, steel has very high long elastic modulus than copper, aluminum, zinc depending upon their bond strength. Okay. Th they will be grouped in different categories here, uh, some for polymers also are shown here, polymer and composite. Now, uh, after uh, understanding the elastic deformation and Young's modulus, there is another very important uh, parameter when you are doing deformation under elastic limit is called Poisson's ratio. Okay. What does it mean? That when I am applying a tensile stress for example, in z, z, z axis okay, in this direction. So, when I am elongating in z, axis, z direction, there has to be contraction in the x and y direction. Okay. So, that is what is there. So, when I am doing a stretching along z axis, there has to be contraction along the x and y axis. The lateral strain, lateral means this two in x and y direction is a constant fraction of a strain in the longitudinal direction that is the in the z direction and that is known as Poisson's ratio. So, th suppose this is a cube okay, as shown here. Okay and uh, I want to apply a force here in z axis and because of that it will deform elongate in z direction and there will be contraction in x and y direction. Okay. So, if you measure all these uh, uh, dimensions, okay, the, the strain in the x or y direction divided by the strain in the z direction will give you the Poisson's ratio. So, Poisson's ratio nu is equal to lateral strain about longitudinal strain. Okay. So, epsilon x in the x direction or epsilon y in the y direction is equal to minus nu of epsilon z. Okay. Why we are keeping uh, minus sign here is the, because if a strain in the z direction is tensile, the strain in x and y direction is there is a contraction, okay. there is a negative. Uh, dilation. Okay. So, that is why we are using minus here okay. that epsilon s will be equal to minus of uh, nu into epsilon z okay. or uh, epsilon y is equal to minus of nu into epsilon z. Okay. So, if one is tensile other way has to be compressive and that is why the negative sign. Now, there is another concept called el elastic strain energy as you can see that when I am uh, deforming it my potential energy is increasing that means I am storing the uh, strain energy in the material in, in of course elastic strain energy in this case because we are doing it under elastic limit. 
So, elastic deformation is stored as elastic strain energy in the material okay, and how, wh wh what do we mean by energy? Energy is equal to force into distance. So, during elastic deformation it is area under the load deformation curve. So, if I instead of plotting stretch versus strain, if I plot deformation versus load, area under the curve okay, and area under the curve will be equal to half of uh, force into displacement okay, and that will give me the area under the curve. So, this is my elastic strain energy which is stored in the material when I am deforming it and when I release the force. Okay, this strain energy will be recovered okay. and of course, this energy has to go somewhere actually it will go in heating the material. Okay. So, if I keep on doing suppose this continuously after some time you will see that the material is heated up okay, because this strain energy which is stored will be dissipated in form of heat and slowly you will see that there the temperature of your material is rising if you keep doing this for uh, uh, quite number of time. Okay. So, with this uh, we have covered the elastic uh, uh, part of the, uh, the deformation okay. very important for a mechanical engineer uh, and of course, you have a, a kind of a full course on that in terms of strength of materials course. Okay, where the, the whole treatment is under elastic limit and uh, actually you under try understand the whole elastic deformation in, in much detail than what we did here. Okay, here we are just uh, kind of uh, trying to understand that when you do a stress strain deformation or you plot a stress strain curve there has to be some elastic region and then there has to be some plastic region okay, and in elastic region you can have certain things which we un uh, try to understand in the present lecture. So, thank you very much.